A couple of years ago, I did a video on how to apply decorator's cork to skirting boards. Now, that video has been pretty well received, but I was criticised by some for my over-reliance on a certain profiling tool. With some justification, and of course, there is always room for improvement. So here is my fully improved and updated video. I'm going to be discussing all the main techniques for applying decorator's cork, and I'm going to be explaining which techniques I've used and why for the skirting boards that I recently installed in my bedroom. And finally, I've trawled through all the comments from my previous video, and I'm going to be passing on to you some of the best tips and suggestions that I've received. In today's toolkit, we've got our cork applicator gun, more on which in a minute. Onto the decorator's cork, I've used GeoCell a lot in the past, but bought this version from EvoStick a week or so ago, and it's worked fine. I'll also be using this gap filling adhesive for reasons I'll explain shortly. If you're corking the traditional way, it's a good idea to have a small piece of foam handy. The smaller the piece, the better, and you can improvise with whatever you've got lying around the house. On to alternative corking methods, I'll be showing you how to use a profile tool. I bought this Kramer 5 kit a few years back for some bathroom siliconing and more recently upgraded to the profiling kit 7. It's worth getting the kit 7 with its extra tools as they're a similar price, although I won't be using the extra tools in today's video. These kits are around the £20 mark in the UK and if you're watching this in the US you'll find it for a similar price at Home Depot which also has a cheaper DAP kit. And at Lowe's, you can buy this kit. In Australia, at Bunnings, you've got this kit. And back here in the UK, you can get a cheap copy at B&Q. But the profiles on this tool are, in my opinion, far too big to be practical. And it always pays to have a damp cloth close at hand, as well as a bucket of water and or some decorator's wipes. And finally, it's worth having a roll of tissue and a bin or bag close by whilst you're working so that you can remove the residue and dispose of it to keep your working area clean. Details of all today's tools will be in the description below the vid, where you can also find a link to my new Amazon store, which basically links to my entire tool collection arranged into handy categories. Now, a quick word before we start about the sealant gun itself. In the past, when I bought the cheap sealant guns like this, I found they've broken very quickly, as you can see from this reviewer here from April this year. Either the components snap or the pressure that's supplied isn't constant. So it pays to spend a little bit more between 10 and 20 pounds on a heavier duty, better quality sealant gun. And then you'll have something like this, which has lasted me 10 to 15 years. Let's have a quick chat about decorator's cork. It's water-based, it's great for filling small gaps between skirtings or baseboards and the walls, or between architraves and door frames or walls. And the crucial thing about it is it can be over-painted. But it's far from perfect. Being water-based, it shrinks. So for larger gaps like I've got, as you'll see in a moment, it's not great. And if you do use it for larger gaps, you may need at least two applications because of the shrinkage. It's also of limited use as an adhesive. It's fine for stable materials like MDF, but for natural timbers, if the wood moves, it'll probably leave the cork behind, as you see here on my newly installed skirtings. So that brings us on to gap adhesives. I actually bought this one from my local timber merchants when I bought the skirting boards. Now, if you've watched my last video on installing the skirting boards, you'll know I didn't actually use it to glue the skirting boards in place, but I had such large gaps between the skirting boards and the wall because of the extent to which my timbers warped, that I decided to use this adhesive to fill the gap prior to corking. Like the cork, it's also water-based, and I'd really recommend the gap-filling adhesives for larger gaps like mine. This gap adhesive can be painted. It doesn't shrink anything like the cork did, and it's a much better adhesive, really binding my skirting board to the wall in a way that the decorator's cork didn't. But research carefully before you buy, because whilst this gap adhesive can be tooled just as easily as decorator's cork, other gap adhesives like Grip Fill Original certainly can't. Obviously, it's more typical to use adhesive on the back of the skirting board before pressing it into place. Now, for completeness, I should mention that you can't use silicon in place of decorator's cork on things like skirting board architraves anywhere where you want to overpaint, because you cannot paint on top of silicon. Whilst this might be obvious, the reason I mentioned this is because I had a few comments on my last video to ask me why I'd use silicon. And I suspect this has come from a confusion, a difference in terminology, because here in the UK, when we talk about cork, we're only really talking about decorator's cork. Whereas I believe in the US and possibly elsewhere, cork is a much more generic term and can be subdivided into decorator's cork, roof repair cork, concrete repair cork, the list goes on. So we're now onto the question of at what point in the decorating process we should actually apply the cork. 
If your walls are newly plastered, you want to get the mist coat out of the way before installing your skirtings and before corking. Mist coating is the watered down coat of emulsion you paint onto the walls to seal them and to prevent subsequent coats of paint peeling off. And it's a messy process because it's watered down, so you want to get this out of the way first. A link to a recent video I did on this is coming up on the screen now. You'll also want to cork before painting your walls with the final two emulsion top coats. Why? Because you'll be wanting to paint or cut in the walls down to and including the decorator's cork. I made the mistake in my last video for which I received some justified criticism of not doing this. I corked after applying the final top coat emulsion. And this was a risky strategy because a lot of paints like this flat mat which I painted this room with cannot be spot repaired without flashing of the paint, unsightly patches appearing on the surface of the paint. Annoyingly, since I painted this room, Johnson's have discontinued that paint and they've now brought out this perfect mat if you want that chalky finish. And apparently this paint can be spot repaired. But it's still wise to cork before applying your final two top coats of emulsion to the walls. How much of the skirtings to paint before corking is a little trickier. I corked before priming mine, but should have done so after priming as this would have saved me the process of cutting in the Zinza BIN primer up to the cork. I didn't want to apply the final top coat before installing my skirtings as some people do because I was screwing my skirtings to the wall and would have had to totally repaint the skirtings as there would have been very obvious patches or flashing of the paint if I'd tried to spot paint for filled screw holes. Okay, a few quick tips before we move on to the corking techniques. Obviously you've got to cut the tube open, which you can do with a Stanley knife or a multi tool like this. Then you want to cut the nozzle as small as possible. Notice I've cut the nozzle straight rather than at a diagonal. Anyone who's watched my silicon videos will know that I do this to maximize the amount of cork that goes into the gap. If you cut it straight, you're forcing it into the gap. If you cut it at a diagonal, there's more of a tendency to drag the silicon and not get so much in. For corking, I wouldn't get too hung up about this, and if you prefer to cut at a diagonal, go ahead and do it. The smaller the gaps, the smaller the nozzle, and the less wastage you'll have. Release the pressure in the gun after each pass so that the cork doesn't keep squeezing out. I spoke earlier on about the benefit of a roll of tissue to keep the nozzle clean in between corking runs, but I also like to have the bucket of water so I can clean down my finger when I'm using the finger technique to cork, and also clean down the forming tools when I use those. And of course, any smears or smudges on the skirting boards themselves. Okay, we're on to corking techniques. I'm gonna be running through the no tool technique, using your finger with or without a damp cloth or foam. And finally, I'm gonna run through the benefits of using a forming tool. Now, the first technique came from a comment under my last video, the idea being that there's no need to wipe or form the bead in any way if you lay a proper bead in the first place. Some pros obviously do this, but I think we can discount this technique and move on pretty quickly. It's difficult for us DIYers to lay a flawless bead without any smoothing as you need lots of practice to do that. And we're typically corking on an irregular basis. Also, even a neat bead like this is going to have the odd area that's not properly knitted to the surface beneath. I can see the benefits of this technique if you've got, for example, oak skirting boards that you're not gonna to want to paint. But even in this situation, a forming tool, as you'll see in a minute, comes into its own. And in fact, even this guy acknowledged that where he's got large gaps, he uses the forming tool. So we're onto the good old fashioned finger, the choice of most professional painters combined with a damp cloth or a bit of foam. It's the most widely used technique because we've all got at least one of these and provided it's done properly, you can achieve fantastic results. What do I mean by that? Well, too thick a bead and when you tool it, even with a wet finger, you'll end up with a wide smeared bead of cork smeared both along the skirting and the wall. Yes, you can cover with paint, but maybe it's me being OCD, but I like a nice strong bead of cork with distinct lines, which makes the cutting in process easier. You can wipe it a few times with a wet sponge to tidy it up a bit, but with that extra water, you're only then increasing the chances of it shrinking. So if you are gonna use a finger technique, I would say be really careful with the cork that you apply. Make sure it's a beautiful, thin, constant line like this. Remember to release the pressure on the gum. Get your finger a little bit damp and then very gently draw it along like that. That way you're not smearing any excess cork on the wall or on the skirting. No excess cork means almost no wastage. And I've used this technique combined with the foam a lot in this bedroom to achieve really pleasing results. 
So we're on to the final section of this video and the third technique, the profiling tool. And I'm going to be concentrating mainly on this tool with its five and eight millimeter diagonal profiles and its concave profile, and to a lesser extent this tool with its 90 degree profile. But if the finger technique just outlined is so good, why do we need to use a profiling tool, I hear you ask? Well, there are a few good reasons. For a start, you're not using any water in the tooling process, which is kinder on your paintwork, particularly if you've just done a mist coat, which can rub off quite easily. And it's maximizing the strength of the bead and minimizing the chances of shrinkage. Secondly, you get a consistently high quality professional bead every time you use the tool. Whereas if you're relying on the traditional technique, you've got to be really concentrating really on your game to lay that perfect bead every time you cork. Thirdly, it's the ease of use and speed of this tool that really appeals, particularly for us DIYs who are only doing this occasionally. You see here that with an imperfectly laid bead like this and taking the concave profile on the tool, you can tool the bead to a near perfect finish. The fourth point to make is this tool really comes into its own when you've got large gaps to fill. I made the error of buying pine skirtings for this room which warped when I got them home, leaving me with eight millimeter gaps in places. After an unsatisfactory result filling one run with decorator's cork, I decided to fill the remainder of the gaps with the gap adhesive that you saw earlier. The idea being to use the 90 degree profile for a bead that was flat with the top of the skirting, so that I could then add a final concave or diagonal profile before painting. And of course, because we've already filled the gap with the gap adhesive, the final profile, whether that's concave or diagonal, is less likely to shrink. I was criticized for using this 90 degree profile in my last video, because the gaps were very small and any movement would be susceptible to cracking. But for large gaps like this, when you're adding an additional bead afterwards, it really comes into its own. And I'll mention this because people sometimes ask, but it's the smooth, not the beveled side that you're dragging into the decorator's cork to form the bead. Now the main criticism that's leveled at this tool is the amount of wastage that it creates, which by its nature it's gonna do, because obviously it's scooping away all that decorator's cork create the wonderfully neat profile. To minimize waste, before you start, cut the nozzle a fraction wider than the profile you've selected. Then experiment on a short section. You'll know if you haven't removed enough because the tool won't be properly forming the bead. You can then just use the right angle profile to scoop that off, recut the nozzle and start again. But you can minimize wastage by retooling the excess cork back into the gap as I've done here, or back into the bead you're forming if for whatever reason you miss a bit. Another criticism leveled at this technique is that this tool is primarily designed as a siliconing tool for smooth surfaces. And so running the tool along a skirting is gonna quickly wear it out. And there is an element of truth to that. If you look at the right angle profile here, you'll see the wear on it. But a little gem of wisdom came from Arthur Kloss in the comments section to my last video, where he suggested rubbing it on a fine grit sandpaper, much like sharpening a knife. I was a little skeptical about rehoning a plastic tool with sandpaper, but with some 2000 grit wet and dry I bought from Halfords years ago, knocking about, I thought I'd give it a go. I laid it on my kitchen table rather than his more sensible suggestion of using a bit of marble tile. But even with that, to my complete surprise, it worked just as he described. And I've basically now got a Kramer tool that is rehoned to factory condition. So thanks Arthur for that brilliant tip. Would I be tempted to leave the cork at 90 degrees as you saw earlier with the gap adhesive? Well, no, because it's really hard to cut in to paint a 90 degree angle as opposed to a concave profile or the diagonal you see here. Personally, I favor the diagonal profile because of my experience siliconing where it produces a far stronger bead than the concave. But I accept I may be wrong here because as you can see in this visual, it does produce a very strong line on the wall. Clearly wouldn't get this line with a concave profile, but the problem with concave profiles is with large eight millimeter gaps like this, the tendency is for the cork to shrink below the line of the skirting board, thereby creating a dust trap. And this dust trap will be less pronounced with the diagonal profile where the cork bead is much deeper where it hits the skirting than it is with the concave profile where the cork is very prone to shrinkage where it is effectively tooled flat with the skirting at this point here marked with the arrows. And don't forget on the small gaps, the diagonal profile effectively turns into a concave when the cork shrinks anyway. Just do a diagonal because nobody's gonna scrutinize your cork like I'm having to do in this video, but maybe let me know in the comment section below what you think. My job painting was in the end made a lot easier having listened to a Radio 6 show with uh, an amazing interior designer, Abigail Ahern. We were gonna paint the skirtings a contrast color 
colour, but in the end we decided to paint the ceilings, walls, skirtings, windows, everything the same colour. And I'm so pleased we did because it's made the room seem a lot bigger and it doesn't distract your eye to the contrast paint. So after all this, which technique do I think is best? Well, as you've seen today, I've used all the techniques to make this video, which I've really enjoyed. And what it's made me realise is I use all the techniques except the no tool technique and I simply decide which technique is most appropriate for the particular thing that I'm corking. So for example, for this tricky space where I scribed the skirting into the architrave, I started off with a forming tool and then used a razor blade and a damp piece of foam was literally the only tool that could form the cork around the torus profile of the skirting. And if I'm honest, for a lot of the cork beads that I smoothed with my finger, I finished off tooling them with the concave profile on the Kramer tool because I just love the efficient, cleanly tooled cork line you end up with. And tooling awkward spaces like this also becomes effortless when using the right angle profile on the Kramer tool. So I leave you now hoping you're armed with all the techniques you need to complete your corking job. And as ever, keep the comments flying in because I think they provide a fantastic resource for anyone who chances upon them. So it's been another long video today. Congratulations if you've got this far and a big thank you. If you found it useful, do please click on the like button below. Don't forget details of all the tools I've used today will be in the description below the video, which of course you can access on your smartphone by clicking on the little arrow and on your PC by clicking on the show more button. In the description, you'll also find a link to my PayPal page in case you fancy sending me a pound or two to help me keep creating this free content. Can't thank everyone enough who's donated in the last few weeks. And finally, if you're new to my channel, I'd love to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here. Don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all the videos that I post. And you'll also find there a link to my Amazon store, which is basically a catalog of my entire tool collection with comments against certain tools explaining why I find them so useful. I'm not physically selling this stuff, but I'm linking to people who are. And by you clicking and buying from these links, it doesn't cost you any extra, but it helps me by giving me a small commission. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.